Hey everyone, we are finishing Little Bridges, Father and I Were Ranchers by Ralph Moody today. Um, it would be chapters 30 and 31. And if you don't mind, if you've enjoyed this book, if you could just give it a like and let me know um, what you thought. If you enjoyed the book and just um, maybe a comment about it. So, um, all right. We moved to Littleton. We moved to Littleton between Christmas and New Year's. Father and mother found a seven room house on the south edge of town and Fred Altland helped us move. There was a barn and a chicken house and a little piece of ground where we could have a garden. Besides King, we took Lady, Babe and the chickens with us. We didn't live very far from the schoolhouse and mother took us over the first day after New Year's. It seemed to us like an awfully big school. There was a separate room for each grade. After the principal had asked us some questions and had us read to him, he put Grace in the eighth grade and me in the sixth. Muriel went into the fourth grade and Philip in the second. Starting school in Littleton wasn't a bit like starting in a, at the ranch. Of course, I didn't know any of the kids but they all knew who I was. I guess there had been something in the paper about my writing in the roundup. It was right after we moved to Littleton, Littleton that father was made boss on the house building job. I don't think I ever saw him more pleased about anything. He told me about it one night when we were eating supper. I knew he had been worrying about the house because I had heard him tell mother the framing wasn't true and there'd be trouble when they went to put the roof on. That house at supper, sorry, that night at supper, he told us the owner had come out and caught them splicing rafters that had been cut too short. Mother took a quick little breath and said, Charlie, does that mean Father looked up and smiled. Yes, ma'am, that means, he said, that he, he made me boss carpenter. I'm getting $4 a day. I know I can make a good job of it. He took a couple more mouthfuls and then he looked up again. How does that in line near the end of Hamlet go? The one about there being a divinity? Mother knew them all, I guess. She got tears in her eyes and in her voice too. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will, she repeated. Father looked, nodded. That's the one. How do you remember them all, Mame? I think that pleased her as much as the four dollars a day. I had gone to school in Littleton about six weeks before I got into any big trouble. The teacher in our room was a widow. She was almost a Mrs. Kokorian kind of woman. I don't think she ever said anything nice if she could find a way to say it mean. The only times she was really pleasant were when Mr. Purdy brought eggs and butter to her. Mr. Purdy was a widower who lived four or five miles up the Platte River, and he used to bring the eggs and butter during school. Sometimes they would stand at the door of the classroom for nearly half an hour, whispering and giggling. Mr. Purdy came to the door one day in February, just after recess, and just after they, put, they had put new gravel on the school yard. The yard was wet and he had all lugged, we had all lugged gravel in on the soles of our shoes. When Mr. Purdy had talked to Mrs. Upson, for nearly 15 minutes, one of the boys started to scuff his feet back and forth. Inside of a minute, everybody in the school room, in the room was scuffing, and it sounded like 40 stream engine, steam engines all puffing at once. Mr. Purdy left in a hurry, and Mrs. Upson went flying out after him. She was back in two minutes with the principal, but the room was quiet, as quiet as if it had been empty. The principal was a big, handsome man with wavy brown hair and red cheeks. I don't suppose he was more than a year or so younger than father, probably 32 or, or three. 
but he didn't look within 10 years of being as old. He stood up in front of the class and clapped his hands. Then he said, I want all the children who scraped their feet to stand up. Dutch Gunther was the first one up and his brother, Bill, was right behind him. Then I looked around. There were seven of us boys standing, not a single girl. There must have been 30 of us in the class and if the principal had bothered to look, he could have seen scratch marks on the floor under every desk. He folded his arms and glared at us for a couple of minutes. Then he said, I might have known the worst boys in the whole school. You follow me. He marched out of the room like one of the drill sergeants over at Fort Logan, and he marched after him. When we were through, were going through a coat corridor, Dutch whispered back to me, don't let him make you holler, little britches. He led us down to the room in the basement and took a whip off a hook on the wall. It was a mean looking whip. It was like a bull whip, except that it was only about a foot and a half long. And it had three cattails at the end. Bill got 14 licks before he hollered and three afterwards. I didn't do so well. I had cracked a couple of ribs at the time we lost Fanny and knobs had grown over the cracks. The first thing he swung, the first time he swung the, the whip, the cattails hit right over the knobs and it felt as if I were being stabbed by a dozen broken bottles. I thought mother would go wild when I got home. She would have gone right over to the schoolhouse if I hadn't told her it would only make it worse for me. She washed the places where the cracker cut through my skin, but some salve on, put some salve on and put me to bed. Afterwards, she brought me up some brandy with sugar and water, but it didn't taste as good as it used to, and my back was so sore I had to lie on my stomach. She must have told father as soon as he got home from work. He hadn't been in the house more than a few minutes when I heard him coming up the stairs. After he said, hello, son, he turned down the bedcloths and looked at my back. I couldn't have told by the sound of his voice or what he said, but I knew he was mad because those muscles at the sides of his jaws were working out and in. After he would looked at all the welts, he said, gave you a good one, didn't he? Well, you've been hurt worse than this and got over it. I guess you'll live. Let's get some clothes on and go down to supper. While I was dressing, he sat on the edge of the bed and said, You know, son, sometimes a fellow has to take a licking for doing the right thing. A licking only lasts a short while, even if it's hard on one. But failing to do the right thing will often make a mark on a man that will last forever. Let's go down and eat. Father's house was pretty nearly finished. At supper, he said there would only be about another week's work, but a man had come to see him about building another, and he was going to start on the 10th of March. He walked more at, he talked more at supper than I had heard him for a long time, but he didn't say a word about my getting a whipping at school. Grace started to say something about it, but he kept right on talking about the house, she, so she had to keep still. Mother sent us all to bed as soon as the dishes were done, but I couldn't go to sleep. I must have lain there about an hour when I heard Father go out the front door. It was about an hour before I heard him come back. He called me to get up at the regular time in the morning, and when we were eating breakfast, I noticed his hands were all swollen up and dark looking across the backs. I wonder what he had been doing because I was sure I would have noticed if he if they had been swollen like that when he was talking to me the night before. I thought I could figure it out if I could find out where he had been, so I asked him if I didn't hear him go out somewhere. He was wiping syrup off his plate with a piece of hot biscuit and said, Oh, I just had to go see a fellow about a dog. Mother looked up quickly and said, I think you got back it you got it backwards, but father just kept wiping up syrup. Grace had gone back after school and got my coat and cap, 
and mother didn't say anything about not going to school, so I went. I think I must have gone past the principal's office seven or eight times that day, but I never saw him. The door to his office was always open, but he was never in there. He wasn't there for several more days either. The kids said somebody had given him an awful beating, but I guess I was the only one who had ever had any an idea of who that somebody was. I never even told Grace. Father finished his house on the 5th of March. I remember the date as well as if it had been yesterday. Ever since we had moved to Littleton, Father had been planning to fix Mother's chicken house, but he was never home in daylight, except on Sundays. The first day after his job was finished, he started on the chicken house. I went out to help him as soon as I got home from school. He must have been thinking about the licking I got from the principal because I had only been working a little while when he said, you're getting to be quite a man now, son. You're well past 11 years old and you can do quite a few things better than a good many men. I'm going to treat you like a man from now on. I'm never going to spank you again or scold you for little things or someday it's going to be Moody and Sons building contractors. Chapter 31, So Long Partner. I had never known ladies old as cold much till we moved to Littleton because father had always pastured her away from our place. After we moved to Littleton, he began gentle breaking her on Sundays. There really wasn't much to do. She was a beautiful thousand pound sorrel, as gentle as lady. By the time father finished his house building job, he could drive her almost anywhere. The morning after we fixed the chicken house, he was talking about her at breakfast. Lady hadn't had a colt for the year, colt the year before, and wasn't going to have one that year. Mother said it was a shame not to be raising a colt after the good price we got for her. For lady's last one. Father looked up and said, what would you think about babe? I've been thinking I might drive her up to Fort Logan this afternoon. Judge Rutgers got a horse up there that I think might make a good husband for her. I hadn't been home from school more than five minutes that afternoon before Dr. Stone brought, brought father. They were leading babe behind the buggy and there were cut wire cuts on her shoulder and for, for off, off foreleg. Father had court plaster on the side of his face and his arms, arms weren't in the sleeves of his coat. When he got out of the buggy, I could see that his legs were, was bandaged. His overalls were torn half off one leg and bandage showed through. Mother, Grace, and I ran out to meet them. We were scared to death, but Father grinned and said it was nothing, that he had just been scratched a little. Dr. Stone didn't talk that way, though. He said it was lucky Father was still alive. After he and Mother had put Father to bed, they came out into the kitchen, and Dr. Stone told us what had really happened. There were big iron gates at the entrance to Fort Logan and brick walls ran both back both ways. Anyone driving on the road outside the wall couldn't see a team coming out of the fort till it came through the gates. Father and Babe had been almost up to the entrance when the horseless carriage came racing out of the fort. Babe had never seen one before and reared. The man who was driving the machine tried to stop, but it went into a fit of backfiring Babe whirled off the road and plunged into a gully with a barbed wire fence running through it. Father was thrown out when the buggy upset, but jumped up and flung his weight onto Babe's head so that to keep her from destroying herself in the wire. He was badly bruised and torn before he quieted her. That summer on the ranch, without any crops and only a few days of haying, had been good for Father's lungs until the night he was hurt. I don't think I had heard him cough in months, but that night I could hear him long after I had gone to bed. It must have been that he got his chest squeezed 
when he was wrestling with Babe down there in the, that gully. Father called me as usual the next morning, but he looked bad when I came down to breakfast. Where it wasn't skin, his face was gray, and he had a little hacking cough that sounded as if it started clear in the bottom of his lungs. It was one of those cold, drizzly March mornings, and Mother wanted him to go back to bed, but he wouldn't. He said he had promised the undertaker he would dig a grave that day, and it might be his only chance to build a house that would last until doomsday. Mother didn't like it and said that it was no time for banter, because if he had he worked out in the rain in his condition, he might be digging his own grave. Father chuckled a little when he got up from the table and rumpled my hair. We Moody's are tough fellows, aren't we, son? He said. Before he went out, he laid his hand on Mother's shoulder and said, Don't worry, Mame. I'm not sick. I'm just scratched up a little. This job will only take half a day, and there's three dollars in it. The job did take longer than half a day, and I had been out of school an hour before Father got home. Mother had him put dry clothes on right away and made him drink some brandy in hot water. I don't know whether it was brandy that made Father talk that night or whether he had a premonition. He had never told us youngsters about anything uh, in his childhood or things he had done before we were old enough to remember. That night, we sat at the supper table for nearly two hours while Father told us about the little backwoods farm in Maine where he had brought up his by his deaf mute father and mother and about going to visit his uncle's family when he was eight years old so that he could learn to talk with his mouth as well as his fingers. He told us about grafting apple logs in, onto birch trees and about lowering himself down into the well so he could see the stars in the daytime. But he didn't tell us anything about being, in, being the New England bicycle racing champion. Mother told me about that afterwards. I heard him coughing every time I woke up during the, that night, and the next morning he stayed in bed. The doctor from Littleton came that evening and said father had pneumonia. He was so sick that the doctor would only let us go in and see him once during the next week. Father had sent us all to take a long walk on Sunday afternoon so as to get us out from underfoot. She had spent almost an hour, every hour with Father since he had taken sick, and her nerves were so unstrung that we irritated her. When he came home from our walk, when we came home from our walk, the doctor said we could each go in and see Father for just a minute. Grace went first, and then it was my turn. He looked so bad it frightened me when I went into the room. I couldn't talk, couldn't think of a thing to say, and I guess Father was so sick he couldn't either. I had found a coil of inch rope lying beside the road when we were we had been walking, and it brought it home. I could only think to tell Father about the rope. He raised his hand up a little and took it. His voice was almost a whisper, and he said, "You take care of it, partner. You may need it." That was the last thing I ever heard him say. Afterwards, Mother told me he had asked for me, his, for me his last day, but the doctor wouldn't let her see, send to, to school for me. When we got out of school at noon, 10 days after Father had taken sick, Hal was waiting for us with a note. The doctor had sent a nurse to help Mother for the past few days, and the note was in her handwriting. It said for us to go to the Roberts house for our lunch and not to come home. They lived a block nearer the schoolhouse than we did, and we and were good neighbors to us. They had the only telephone in the neighborhood, and while we were eating, the nurse came in to use it. I think it was Cousin Phil, she called. After she told, uh, told who she was, she said, We've got to have a tank of oxygen out here right away. Yes, yes, it's got to get here right away if it's going to do any good. Hal was waiting for us with another note <clears throat> when school let out. 
That one named different houses for us to go to until mother sent for us. I was to go to the Roberts. When I got there, Mrs. Roberts gave me a piece of bread and jam. I was standing just outside the parlor door eating when the nurse came in. She didn't say anything to Mrs. Roberts or to me, but walked right across the parlor and cranked the telephone. I thought it might be something more about oxygen, so I stepped over where I could hear better. The nurse spoke a number into the telephone, and in a minute she told who she was and said she was talking for mother. Then she said, her husband has died about 20 minutes ago. You better pick the body up right away. I want to get rid of it as soon as we can. Her nerves are going all to pieces. It was too big for me to take in all at once like that. I didn't feel like crying. I didn't like feel like anything. My brain just stopped working for a minute or two. When it stopped, when it started up again, it was going round and round like a stuck gramophone cylinder and was saying over and over, so long partner, so long partner, so long partner. Bessie and Mistress Altland came to say, stay with mother that night and we youngsters stayed where the note had told us to. My mind was sort of numb during the days before father's death and the funeral. Things had happened still seem unreal. I do remember that I got a new blue serge suit, the first suit I'd ever had that mother didn't make, but I don't remember where it came from. All our old neighbors from the ranch were at, were at father's funeral, and I never knew till then how much they really cared for him. After the services, Dr. Brown glanced at mother's red streaked hand and said, Mrs. Moody, that is a surgeon's blood poisoning. If you're ever to raise Charlie's children, you must come home with me at once. Hang on, <laughs> forgot the picture. Everybody was shocked except mother. She was a small woman and Dr. Brown was very a very large man. She looked up into his face and said, yes, doctor, I know. I believe I have no choice in the matter. All our neighbors, both from the ranch and from Littleton, pressed around, offering to take us youngsters in. Cousin Phil said something about writing our other relatives in New England. For just one moment, mother's eyes flashed. Then she was calm again. No, Phil. I am sure Charlie wants us all to be together. Then she parceled out us out to near neighbors, being sure that Hal went there where there was a good cow and that Muriel went to a motherly woman without too many youngsters of her own. At the end, she said to me, son, I want you to stay with Laura Pease where you will be near home and can take care of Lady and the Hens. Tomorrow you take Babe over to Mr. Hawkaday and tell him father would have wanted him to have her. He needs a good horse and he's a fine, honest man. He'll pay us all she's worth. Then she thanked our neighbors and kissed us all around, leaving me till the last. I remember how my lip trembled, wondering if I were the least. She didn't cry until she put her hand on my head and said, you are my man now, I shall depend on you. Mother will be home in two weeks. It was not two weeks before. At the end of the first week, before Dr. Brown was sure he wouldn't have to amputate the arm, mother sent for Grace and me. Grace had her 13th birthday two days after father died. We harnessed Lady to the spring wagon and drove to Denver stopping by the river to gather a bouquet of pussy willows. At Doc Brown's big house on Capitol Hill, we were only allowed to see mother for a few minutes. She was so thin, we hardly knew her. Her eyes were deep in her, their sockets with black circles around them. For the first time, I noticed white in her hair. Her voice was very low, almost a whisper. 
She put her hand, her good hand out for us and smiled. Mother is going to be all right, she said. I have talked to the Lord about it, all about it. <clears throat> he knows you, you need me. And with him and Dr. Brown, I shall be all right. Dr. Brown started to lead us from the room. When we reached the door, mother called back, called me back. She took me by hand, took my hand and said, the peas should have been planted on St. Patrick's Day. You know where the seeds are in the barn loft. Soak them overnight and put plenty of hen manure deep in the trench. I don't know why that made her, me cry when I hadn't before. Who heavy. <laughs> But from the mo that moment, I was sure she was coming home. It was late in the afternoon of a pleasant mid-April day when they brought Mother home. Cousin Phil drove her out in his first automobile. Two-cylinder Buick with shiny brass rods <clears throat> to support the windshield. Doc Brown and a nurse came with them, then carried Mother into the house and put her to bed downstairs in the parlor. When I came in to see, came in, she was saying to the nurse, I am perfectly all right now. All I need is my children. As quickly as I could get out, I harnessed Lady to the spring wagon and started the collection of brothers and sisters. Mother could be quite persuasive if necessary. She must have been so with Dr. Brown because just as we turned into the lane, the Buick was pulling away from our house. Dr. Brown and the nurse waved to us from the back seat as we went by. I, I was the last one into the house because I had to unhitch Lady. Most of the tears were shed before I got there, and Mother was propped up in the bed with Hal still sobbing and trying to bury his nose in her side. <laughs> her right hand was heavily bandaged. <clears throat> When I came in, she organized the first meeting of the clan of Moody. Now, let's not be sorry for ourselves anymore, she said. We've got lots of other things to do. First, we must get Mother's hand well. All it will take is good food and good care. I can't think of anything that would be better for it right now than a good chicken stew. Ralph, suppose you dress that big fat buff Orpington hen that didn't lay last winter. Philip, you get Grace or two or three handfuls, armfuls of wood and some shavings so she can start a fire in the cook stove. And Mariel, do you think you could get the new tablecloth out of the dresser drawer and set up a table right here by my bed? When you get the fire going, Grace, put on the big iron pot with some fat in it so it will be good and hot when the hen is ready. And how would you get mother a drink of water? I can't think of a thing that would taste so good as a nice cool dipper of water, right from our well own well. That first supper was the most memorable meal of my life. The big yellow mixing bowl sat in the middle of the table, filled to the brim with well browned pieces of chicken, stewed until it was almost ready to fall off the bones whole potatoes and carrots with big puffy dumplings mixed at the bedside floating on top. Father had always said grace before meals, always the same 25 words and the ritual was always the same. Mother would look around the table to see that everything is in readiness. Then she would nod to father. That night she nodded to me and I became a man. the end. I hope you all enjoyed the book. It's a very good one. <laughs>